Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, I would like to invite you for the selection of financing proposal for public investment sessions. So we have four speakers today. Uh, despite the storm, they were able to make it. And thank you to all of you for coming and staying with us for the rest of the day. Uh, so we have Lee Medin, who is the deputy treasurer of IFC who is moderating the session. And then we have Olga Meruta from the Moldovan External, um, from the Moldovan Debt Management Office, who will provide the Moldovan experience. And we have Hian from the Vietnamese Debt Management Office, who will also provide country experience. And then we have Issam Abu Suleiman, who is the head of the Banking Products Group at the Financial Advisory and Banking Group. Banking group. So I leave the floor to Lee. So thanks. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, and kick off. And uh, I know that the uh, the schedule has changed a lot for reasons beyond anyone's control. So hopefully you're all aware we're going to be talking about project financing solutions. And um, as Cheatham just said, I'm um, uh, joined uh, first on my right um, uh, by Hien from the Ministry of Finance in Vietnam. She's the Deputy Head of Planning and Risk Management um, at the Department of Debt Management and External Finance, um, where she's worked for the past 12 years. So her responsibilities include working with the rating agencies, uh, drafting medium-term debt strategy, and uh, drafting the government annual borrowing and debt repayment plans. So I, I highlight this because as we kind of talk about the different experiences that we've all had on looking for the... Uh, different opportunities for financing projects. I think it's quite interesting to know where, where everyone's coming from. And then directly to my left, um, Olga, uh, who's the deputy head of the public debt department and the head of external financing at the debt division, uh, where she's been for six years. And her responsibilities include uh, collaboration with international organizations and external creditors and donors, negotiation of the financing agreements, uh, granting of the external debt guarantees and certain aspects of debt monitoring and debt servicing. And then finally, all the way uh, far to my left is Isam, um, who's in the World Bank Treasury. He's the head of the banking products in the financial advisory and banking department um, within the bank. So you also have both Isam and myself representing the different aspects of both the World Bank and the IFC Treasuries, and we actually work together um, uh, quite frequently. So just to share one member of the panel who is not with us, and it would have been ideal if they were, is we had also had arranged for um, the vice chairman of Citibank to join us. And he has extensive experience in both project finance globally and also working with multilateral and uh, bilateral development institutions. So I, I highlight that because one of the things I had asked him to do, and he had already prepared was to sort of give a, an, an update or overview of the project financing market globally. And um, unfortunately, on short notice, I am not able to convey nearly as much information as he would have. But I did just want to briefly talk about some of the challenges and opportunities um, that, that we're all facing. So in terms of the challenges, and, and I think these are things that, um, that you all know well, one is the what's going on globally with bank recapitalization and the impact that's having on banks' appetite for financing projects uh, globally. Another is the impact of Basel III and how that's impacting the bank's balance sheet utilization in terms of booking large volume assets and long tenor assets. Um, on the, um, the financing side for banks as well, uh, the reduced access many of the uh, banks have to the debt markets and therefore the reduced liquidity they have for lending into the project finance space. And kind of as a, a final challenge to mention is just the, the overall impact of a slowing GDP growth globally um, and how that's impacting project financing. Now, I think some of the areas, um, uh, so the, the glass is only uh, half full, it's, 
um, is on the, some of the opportunities. So I think we're beginning to see a lot of alternative sources of financing that we hadn't seen before because they're seeking yield in a low yield environment and looking at project finance as a way to enhance their yield. Um, we're seeing relative stability in many of the developing countries, almost to the point where many countries are being seen as a safe haven in the global environment and thus attracting capital flows that they hadn't had access to before, or at least um, such easy access. And finally, the, um, a positive of the slower global growth may be a decrease in the cost of inputs required for some of the newer projects. Now, we're going to start this off by going through three presentations. Um, so the first I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Hian and Olga to present. And they're each going to give an overview of their debt markets um, and other financing sources. And then from that, lead into the processes they have for selecting and financing public projects. Um, after that, um, ESOM is going to share an overview of how the multilateral development banks support project financing in developing countries. And he's going to give an outline of the available financial products that we would have within the World Bank Group and kind of discuss some of the risks that many of these products would mitigate in order to try to give a greater understanding. From there, um, we'll go into a Q&A session, first um, just um, amongst ourselves, and then I'll open that up to um, the rest of the audience. So with that, if I could, I, we can either, we, we can start with Vietnam, if you'd like, Ian, um, and then from there, we'll move on to Moldova um, for Olga's presentation. to present our experience on how to selecting for financing public projects. Uh, here is outlines of our presentations. First, I would like to give some brief introduction on our public debt profile. And after that, uh, I will present how we finance our project public project and how to make the decision on uh, financing utility. Uh, uh, with the adding to uh, legal frameworks, our National Assembly have approved the law on public debt management and uh, it was enacted from, from uh, 2010 January. Under the uh, public debt management law, our public debt includes government debt, government guarantee debt, and local government debt. Uh, it's a little bit different with other countries that uh, our public debt do not include SOE debt without government guarantees. And uh, in this slide, you can see our public debt as of uh, at the end of 2011. Uh, most of our public debts are government debt with 78.7% and government guarantee debt account to 20.5% and only 0.8% are local government debt. And uh, less than half of our public debt are domestic and more than half, 56.3% are external debt. And uh, for the external debt, we, uh, our debt are mostly uh, ODAs and uh, small ones in uh, commercial terms. Um, 
our total public debt to GDP at the end of 2011 was 54.9% and uh, a little bit increased to 2012, 57.8%. And uh, regarding to public projects, our government's focus on the national key investment project aiming at achieving socio-economic development targets uh, including uh, economic stabilization and uh, social welfare. Public projects include infrastructure projects, human resource development projects, and agricultural rural developments, environmental protection, and uh, national security and defense projects. Uh, we are uh, to financing for public projects. We have uh, some kind of source. The first one is the state from state budgets and uh, mostly from tax revenues. The second one is budgets, state budget borrowing. Our, our state can borrow from uh, domestic, mostly by uh, domestic bond. And uh, the second one is ODA and uh, external concessional or commercial sources. And uh, we can uh, finance for public project through government guarantee or uh, by uh, PPP, such as BTP, OT, or something like that. Uh, here is our. Um, uh, priority for the public projects. Every year, the Prime Minister approves the list of the detailed pro projects which will be funded by state budgets for following years, based on the amount of domestic uh, issuance. When the National Assembly discusses the state budget plans for the next year, and uh, basing on the level of Prime Murray budget balance. He is the first source uh, that is domestic source. With regarding to the um, external source, some project, uh, most projects funded by external source, such as ODA, uh, concessional loans, or uh, borrowing from overseas with the government guarantee, will be approved K by K by Prime Minister depend on the negotiation with the creditor. In this case, creditor will take part in the process of project appraisal. Uh, here is our, uh, in this table, we divide into two columns. The first is the source of financing, and the, sec the second column is the kind of project um, for the domestic uh, sources and uh, ODA sources, we first priority for the project in uh, education, healthcare, immigration, and transportation. Those projects have high social benefit but low financial benefits, so um, we uh, priority to use domestic government bonds and uh, ODA is loaned. For the, some projects, we have uh, higher financial benefits, but still have high social benefits. We use ODA, but the government on land to those projects. And uh, we hope, the government hopes that they can be uh, refundable to the state budget. For the external commercial loans, and um, international bond, the government only borrow commercial loans to on lending to profitable projects. We do not use commercial loan to finance for um, state um, for state expenditure on the first the two first kind of projects. For the other sources such as BBT or POT, BT, we use for 
infrastructure projects such as um, highway uh, hospital with high quality uh, bridge, uh, big sea bus or uh, air bus. To manage the public um, projects, the 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 investor have to yearly financial report to the Ministry of Finance, also as well as some um, related ministry. After that, the management agency have to make a report to our Prime Minister how to pass this was ill for investment to those projects. <laughs> Besides that, the um, um, public project we be supervised by uh, auditor and uh, creditor. Here is our challenge to um, manage uh, public projects. When we choose project of the financing source, we do not have clear criteria for allocating limited budget capital among budget, uh, public projects. Uh, for example, if we have many uh, infrastructure projects in uh, 60 provinces, but how we can choose some of them due to limited our funding? Uh, but we do not have clear criteria for choosing projects. Besides us, we do not have clear criteria for allocating cap state capital and uh, on lending to public projects because some of the projects we allocated state budgets, but for the, the same project in other provinces, maybe we have the government have on lending to that project. It's not clearly criteria on when we allocate state capital and when we uh, on lending to project. And the next is uh, our domestic market is uh, underdeveloped, so we have to rely on external shops, bilateral and multilateral donor, because those shops are often long-term uh, funds, and uh, why the government bond, domestic government bond often have short maturity and uh, interest rate is not totally market rate. Uh, our government bonds uh, often in two years or three years, so it's not matched with our public project um, duration. Um, one more challenge uh, for our country is Vietnam become a middle income country. So in the near future, the ODA sources may be degree. So the cost of financing for public projects will be higher. In uh, on a debt management view, we just can do to to overcome the challenge is giving recommendations on how much money that the government should allocate on the public project based on our medium term debt strategy and yearly borrow plans. And uh, our government should provide more incentives, measures to develop PPP ties of project finance in order to decrease public burdens. Here is my presentation on our country's experience. I hope to receive your comment and uh, share your country's ex yeah, experience so I may uh, um, learn some more from your country in uh, our situation. Thank you. Thank you, Hien. Now we're, we're going to move on um, with Olga's presentation on Moldova. And once again, if I could just ask um, that we, for now, keep questions. And once we're done with the presentations, we'll get into the Q&A. The Q Thanks.
Good, after good afternoon, everyone. I'm just very glad to be here to share with you all of you the experience of my country in selecting a financing proposal for project loan. How, how is how, how is happen happens in the Republic of Moldova? So, from the beginning, I would like to share with you the brief overview of uh, my country's central government that um, uh, central government that outstanding. Uh, during uh, the last several years, during the crisis and afterwards, my country was doing, despite the fact that it is a very, sh um, very small country, was doing pretty well in the matter of debt, debt management, keeping its debt management on the sustainable, uh, keeping the, de uh, the debt uh, to GDP on sustainable levels. So, uh, the, despite the fact that in 2008 the debt management to the GDP was like. 11%. The highest hikes was uh, in 2010, uh, when it reached the, the highest level of 26% uh, of GDP, and then it is decreasing till 23% uh, of GDP as of the end of 2011. So, um, on the nominal terms, the total central government debt of Republic of Moldova is 1.6 billion of uh, US dollars, from which uh, 1.1 billion uh, US dollars is external government debt and 0.6% uh, of GDP, uh, 0.6 billion dollars is domestic debt. In the terms of sh as the share of uh, GDP, the external debt is uh, 16.29 percent, and the domestic one is 7.1 uh, percent of GDP. So, but when we are talking about the financing proposal and selecting financial proposal, we will mainly focus on the external debt because all the uh, projects, investment projects, are financed through external sources and not domestically. Therefore, if we are looking at the structure of the external debt outstanding of the uh, central government of the Republic of Moldova, 69.6% .6 of debt is uh, external one. So the, the most relevant um, uh, criterion for external debt outstanding uh, are several, by instrument, by rate, and by creditor. Yeah, by instrument, the external debt outstanding is, co uh, is composed by loans, which represent 84% and SDR allocation will represent 15%. By interest rate, uh, the external debt outstanding with the fixed interest rate is 68.5% and the floating debt is on 31.5%. According to the type of creditors, we have three kind of creditors, multilaterals, which represent 80.5%, bilateral, 18.8 and commercial 0.7. So therefore, it's very clear that the, the most uh, important and the hugest share in the external debt outstanding is the uh, are the creditors of uh, multilateral cre creditors such as World Bank and um, and the International um, Monetary Fund. Therefore, if we are talking about the multilateral uh, creditors, which has their uh, standard conditions of financing, there is a very tight room for decision-making process in order of selecting the best choices, financial choices for uh, for investment projects. From the total external debt outstanding, only 5.2% represented debt with financing choices which should be selected at each disbursement. How it happens? So the main creditors which are proposing uh, their choices are European Investment Bank and uh, Council of Europe and Development Bank. So during the negotiation, we are, they are proposing only the, the highest maturity. So the loan will be up to a certain, uh, certain maturity, but the maturity and all the interest rate and all the costs are selected to each disbursement, to each installment. So from the total committed amount, uh, uh, because we are starting this collaboration with Council of Europe Bank in 2005, and later on in 2007, uh, European Investment Bank were emerging our, our market and uh, starting the collaboration with our country. So the total committed amount since 2005 is around 240.3 million euro, from which um, up to date was disbursed 33.4 million euro, which is 
18.1% of total committed amount. That means that our decision, selected decision, was applied only to 18.1% or 5.2% of outstanding. That means that there is a lot of room of improving the financial choices. There's a lot of, of room of improving the uh, decision-making process. So from a uh, total um, portfolio of the projects, only nine projects are financed by these two creditors who have a very flexible uh, financial options. Uh, uh, the Council of European and Development Bank was financing four projects, and mainly in social and health projects, in a total amount of 33.3 millions of euros, because this, this is my mandate of the Council of European Bank. Uh, the European Investment Bank was financing five, percent, uh, five projects in road infrastructure, water supply, agriculture and in energy. Despite the fact that the mandate of European Investment Bank is only in road infrastructure, water supply, energy, they made the derogation, they, they were, feeling, they were uh, evaluate the project in agriculture and was finding very interesting and uh, was fi or financed a project in a value of 75 million of euros in uh, my country. When we are talking about the process of selec selection of the uh, financing choices, uh, we are um, we are undertaking five, six steps till the final selection of the offer. That means that once the uh, loan offer is submitted to the creditor, to the Minister of Finance, uh, the debt manager should undertake six basic steps till the final one. So the, these steps are analysis of debt portfolio, analysis of compliance with parameters of structure of debt portfolio settlement debt strategy, evaluation of best offer, documenting decision, approval of financial option, and signing of a loan, loan offer and submission to the creditor. So uh, let's start it uh, step by step with step one. What, what is undertaking under the analysis of the portfolio? So we are looking at the, at the last situation of the debt, debt outstanding, analyzing the, the debt to fixed rate versus floating rate, I mean the total debt, because of course from the previous slide you could see, can see that uh, the external debt outstanding is uh, on the fixed interest rate is 69%, but uh, the, we've uh, in total emerging with the domestic debt, which is in short, short, uh, of short maturities and uh, they are considered as a floating rate. So the, this share is decreasing, is almost 50%. Therefore, we are analyzing the whole portfolio. The maturity, that means that we're analyzing the main indicators, average time to maturity, and the debt um, which matures within the one year. And the redemption pro profile. The redemption profile is mainly analyzed for the external one because it has the longest maturity. And uh, we're analyzing the, mainly the period of the maturity proposed in the, in the loan offer, how it will impact the redemption profile as a whole. Um, the step two is analy analysis of compliance of parameters of structure of debt portfolio. Because um, uh, we are very newcomers in uh, issuing and implementing the debt management strategy. The first debt management strategy was issued in 2011 and is implementing, the uh, first year of implementation is 2012. So in the medium run, the debt management uh, strategy will be implemented from 2012 to 2013. So uh, in, uh, in our strategy, we just settled some safety, uh, safety parameters. For example, the domestic debt versus total debt outstanding should be more or equal to 20%. The residual maturity of total debt uh, outstanding, debt maturing with, within one year, should be less or equal to 35%. Debt to fixed interest rate versus total debt outstanding should be more or equal to 50%. An external debt outstanding currency composition, so the share of currency in total versus external debt outstanding should be less equal to 50%. But of course, the most more relevant uh, e the criteriums or the most relevant parameters are the uh, residual maturity and um, debt to fixed interest rate versus total debt outstanding. When um, 
Uh, we are coming to the third, um, third step evaluation of the best, best offer. This is the most comprehensive and most difficult step because we should be have a very huge analysis and based on some very tough arguments uh, uh, brought by the debt managers to the decision, uh, decision makers uh, persons. So um, the main components of a loan offer submitted by the creditor to the debtor is the interest rate which is are offered fixed or floating offers, but floating offers, of course, some of them with each offer, they are, they are proposing their uh, spreads. Maturity, which differs uh, up to 12, 15, 20, 25, but grace period are remaining the same. Repayments, the repayments are also different. The same annual repayments, annual equal payments and annuity payments. So when we're receiving the loan offer, the main challenges we should overcome are based on, on two criteria. The interest rate, uh, which uh, is a fixed versus floating one, both are challenging in, in all, all the times, and the tenor. The tenor, long maturity versus longer maturities, because we can have maturities for 10, 15 years, and the maturities again, I mean, the maturity 10 versus 15 and 15 versus 20 or 25. So which is more relevant for us? So um, in the next, uh, farmer, we will explain actually how we are overcoming these changes, these challenges. The step three is the evaluation of best offer. So how actually it is done in, in our country? We are, we are analyzing because the fixed interest rate is a fixed interest rate and the, according to the floating one, uh, we are analyzing the ac actual level of Euribor or LIBOR and the evolution of the past years. Also, uh, we, uh, evolution of uh, the current year and evolution of the past three years or the evolution before the crisis, how it was considered like in a normal level. So actually, and this is the main challenging point because this is a struggle like with two judgment of yourself. From the beginning, you are thinking that these creditors are smart enough and they are giving you a fixed interest rate which the floating rate will never uh, overcome, will never, um, never be higher than the fixed one. And you may be concerned that you want to, cha to cho cho uh, choose a, a floating interest rate. But, but on the other side, you are thinking that you can never foolish a market. So it will catch you and will punish you for that. Therefore, um, we, uh, this struggle between uh, risk and cost trade-offs, there is always uh, uh, during this process. So also we are analyzing the grant element, but grant element is more relevant for the fixed uh, interest rate choices because the floating, you will never know which will be the level, the final level of the rate. Also, uh, based on the, um, we're generating the cash flow uh, with different stress scenario regarding the assumption of euro LIBOR and LIBOR level. The highest, uh, which was registered like uh, this year, last year, one year ago, because if we're analyzing like the, uh, the evolution of the f past three years, we can notice that the, last, the highest one was in 2011. So we're taking usually the, the current uh, um, floating rate, the one, the highest on the f uh, previous three years, and al al also the worst uh, stress scenario from before the crisis on Euro-IBO reached like 4%. And uh, based on these assumptions, we are generating some, uh, some cash flows and see the difference between the fixed interest rate and the floating one. Also, when we are taking the decision between these two kind of interest rates and also the maturity, we are analyzing the type of a project. If it is a social versus economic one, so perhaps we might not need the maturity, the higher maturity because it's a social one it will not generate uh, enough assets for us. And there is no need to, to pay more money for a longer maturity. Perhaps what is the need for, for longest maturity if your average time to maturity is pretty comfortable enough. So also we're analyzing the financial assets which are backed up to this project. For example, we have some financial uh, investment uh, projects which are on land to other entities. 
Therefore, this on lending is already as a backup, is an asset for your for your uh, for your tranche, and um, you can easily choose a floating rate because it will be assured uh, by the online online uh, entities. Also, um, uh, we are analyzing the um, redemption prof profile. Uh, if uh, the tranches are not so big, so big, we c uh, we can choose maturities shorter because the shorter maturity, like 15 years and not 20 years or 20, not 25, because it will not have a huge impact on your redemption profile. So. Um, after making this uh, analysis of cost and uh, risk trade-offs, we are starting to document the decision. Because uh, documented decision is also an important step because uh, it's always better to think backward. It's easier to think back backward than uh, forward. So in order to formalize every decision that you are taking and the compliance of strategy, or the, the, the risk and cost trade-offs, you should put it on a paper. So uh, after analyzing the offer, we are making an informatory note, uh, which covers uh, several chapters, like the loan offer proposals submitted by the creditor. The second and the, the most important one is analysis of cash flow, grant element, risk assumption, evolution of interest rate of floating interest rate, risk indicators, and uh, the last uh, chapter is conclusion and proposal based on assumption made in compliance with strategy parameters. After we uh, finalize the informatory note and submit it to the, to the Minister of Finance, uh, uh, the Minister of Finance should approve the financial option by um, signing this uh, informatory note because the debt office in my country is directly s subordinated to the Minister of Finance and Minister of Finance is, is the authorized person uh, to sign the disbursement application and the loan offers for, uh, for these projects. Therefore, the approval is just simple. After analyzing by the Minister of Finance, he, he is signing if he, he agree with the proposal uh, or not. So the sixth, the last step, which is the PNATs from all the processes, is the signing of the loan offer and submission to the creditor. This is, is the last uh, step. So based on the selected and approved proposal by the Minister of Finance, he is signing the loan offer. And then this loan offer should be submitted to the, to the creditor. But of course, what do you need? You need sometimes to be very in a very good shape because European Investment Bank, uh, if you are selecting a fixed interest rate, you should submit this proposal in 30 minutes because otherwise it get, gets invalid. But for Council of Europe Bank, uh, these uh, offers are valid like one month, up to one month. And finally, no matter how much science progresses, there will always be decision that but it will inevitably depend on the personal judgment and art of the way you feel the financial markets. So wish you a lot of sensitivity. Great, thanks. Thank you, Olga. And now we have the um, third presentation, which is by Isam in which I mentioned he'll be talking about some of the financial products which are offered by the World Bank Group and the types of risks that these products can be used for in order to mitigate them. Thanks. Thank, <coughs> thank you, Lee, and uh, Ian and Olga also for uh, getting your presentation ahead of me. I think uh, they were very interesting in how each uh, government is looking at uh, financing its project. A couple of things. One. As uh, Lee mentioned at the beginning, I am filling here in the shoes of uh, slightly of uh, what the vice chairman of Citibank was supposed to give you in terms of uh, financial structuring and so on that's coming from the market. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to combine actually a little bit how you can use the multilateral, okay, in bringing in more private funding into your project. And to do that, I just want to introduce the subject of where are all these projects in emerging market. I mean, we know that the private sector has a huge uh, role to play. 
However, a big part of the infrastructure in emerging market is still actually the, uh, the responsibility of governments. And governments, when I say governments, I say it in the broader sense of government. So we have the central government, then we have the sub-national at the state or municipality level, but we have also the state-owned enterprise. When we combine all of these, we can see how much basically is the responsibility of governments in uh, the developmental agenda and infrastructure or social and human resource type of agenda. Now, how can you basically use all of this area in in terms of like uh, and i'm i'm just giving you ideas here not a prescription of what should be or should you be doing on uh, on project finance but there is a whole lot in the multilateral that can help in in funding actually projects and i would distinguish between two type of projects projects that end up basically on the general balance sheet of the government and here you have a distinction between the federal and the subnational and probably the state owned enterprise and projects that are kind of standalone you know they are created as a standalone type of project and an SPV is being created for that and they can from that specific project finance and uh, repay the uh, investors and the borrowers and i divide the spectrum into into two the one that are purely public where only government is, uh, is included in, uh, in managing and funding that project. The one that where you have the PPPs or the private-public partnerships in delivering these projects, and the one that are purely private. And where each of, of those, like if I take the World Bank and you have access to the World Bank group, but you have also access to other multilateral and bilateral that can offer sometimes very similar type of advantage for, uh, for you. So if, if I look at the bank, basically, the World Bank Group, I can see on the public side, you have IBRD and IDA, and these are like two type of uh, institution, one for middle income and one for low income countries. And I heard he and said that it's a disadvantage to become a middle income country. Actually, it's great to become a middle income country and go from low income to middle income and then upper income countries. And, and by going into middle income countries, you also get to have probably a better access to funding from the market, but also a lot of flexibility from a lot of different multilateral that would allow you to work on two parts of the equation that, that Olga and Hien mentioned, which are like the cost and risk of projects. And they are so much related. Sometimes it's, it's a general risk of a government, sometimes a general risk of an institution like state-owned enterprise and so on. But by reducing the risk of any of those uh, elements that goes into a project or on a balance sheet of a government, you can also have two things happening. One, you will reduce the cost of funding of projects in general and the general funding of government or a, or a government institution. But second, the sources of funding start also being much more interesting and probably more diverse. And I'm going to go a little bit to just take a sample. I mean, and this is not all what, what you can have, but just a sample of a project that's probably a couple of billion dollars that, that needs to be, uh, to be financed to see, okay, if we get into the multilateral business and how can we use our line that we have with multilateral just beyond getting loan from them but getting some structuring that might might uh, actually invite private funding into these public sector type of project and i'm going to shift totally to public sector project here from uh, and and how to bring more funding from the commercial side so some of the international multilateral they provide what you call liquidity injection when, when it's needed to reduce the liquidity uh, problem or, or risk of a, of a project. Other part might bring guarantee or credit guarantee just to have less credit riskiness of the main borrower, let's say the government here or, or a state-owned enterprise or a, uh, or a sub-national, to bring funding from the private sector. And that's, that funding, when combined with coverage for certain risk by multilaterals, could be coming at a longer maturity and, uh, and lower, uh, lower cost. And these are like the type of 
of instrument, usually in the guarantee or insurance part, that can actually bring uh, these terms to be better terms in the structure of the project. Now, we can always get to what Olga mentioned, which is a regular loan from, uh, from a multilateral or, or bilateral, and they are usually at a lower uh, cost than the general funding of governments and emerging markets from just going to the market and issuing a bond. And what is important, and a lot of the multilateral also offers to you, is the possibility of reducing the overall riskiness of either that specific funding or for the overall portfolio by using some of the hedging product that they might have to help you basically moving, for example, what Olga mentioned, from a floating to fixed interest rates. So you're taking away the, the interest rate risk. Or, or moving from one currency to the other, either for a new loan or for existing uh, debt portfolio. Or if you are in the, in the business of uh, generating electricity and you have oil prices jumping on you uh, and the volatility of these oil prices affecting the overall riskiness of that balance sheet of a state-owned enterprise, then you can do also something about mitigating the risk of this volatility. The idea here is like, think a little bit beyond the loan part when you are looking at multilateral to see what are the other type of instrument that you could use to reduce the risk of the structure of the balance sheet of the government or that specific institution, but also to attract private funding that otherwise wouldn't be there, or if it is there, it's at much higher cost and lower maturity, which could help in the overall funding of a project, reducing its cost, but also probably improving other terms into that funding. So this is a little bit what I want to put in front of you. I'm not going to go into the detail of, of uh, all of all of these, but but when you're looking at at projects, you're looking basically, at, especially when you're funding it from the outside, you're looking at different type of risk, and mainly the foreign exchange, the interest rate, the liquidity, or the credit, the general credit risk. In some of the cases, you might be looking at oil or gas and so on. If it's an energy project, that that is that this is was that is one of the input. And in all of those, you might actually find that some of the multilaterals and bilaterals can offer you flexibility to reduce those risks. Okay? And, and it's important, and I want to go a little bit to what Lee has mentioned, it's important in these days where the flows of funds going from especially the commercial banking or the banking sector into, into project finance or more on the balance sheet side um, and the Basel III has limited the amount of how much capital is available to invest these days by, by most of the international banks. By using some of those instruments that I mentioned that are not necessarily loan, but managing the risk and covering some of the risk, you might be able to attract those type of funding at probably lower capital allocation from these banks and at the same time, those banks would look at it from, as a less risky type of project where they might have a better or like a better chance to pass them through their credit committee within those banks. So it is, it is a more of helping you structure a more balanced or less risky type of funding or less t risky type of projects and making some of these funding that might not have been available available. Uh, to you. I'm not going to go through this, but this is a list of what, what is available for middle income country today out of IBRD or the World Bank Group. And it's not only loans, and this is where I want just to mention because most of our members are used basically to use uh, IBRD or uh, loans or IDA credits on the public sector side. There are other than that that could be used for the different part and and those are mainly for credit enhancement purposes but also for managing certain type of financial and commodity risk that could be helpful in the project finance area in ge in general but also at the uh, at the balance sheet of government and i want to mention a couple of things special special for the world bank i mean the world bank group managed kind of 
three main balance sheet, if you want. One is for the pure public sector, which is IBRD and for middle income and either for uh, low income countries. You have IFC that works mainly with private sector. However, IFC over the last few years have introduced also with the, with the IBRD and the World Bank a, a window to cover subnational funding for public sector, basically. We're talking about municipality, state-owned enterprise, or state. And this is, this is a part that is also available for funding these projects at that, uh, that level. And the MIGA, the Multilateral Insurance Guarantee Agency, which is mainly works with private sector, have also introduced a line of products that deals with covering credit risk for public sector projects that are getting funding from private sector entity cross-border. So the combination of those give you a nice line of structuring that, that you should think about when you are dealing with a general funding or a project finance type of funding. So I'm going to leave you with this basically in, in terms of probably summarizing a little bit what I said. In, in the World Bank group, and other multilateral, you might find so that some of their financial solution would allow you to do a few things on covering the financing gap that you might have at probably better terms than what you might be able to get from the market directly, managing the financial risk of some of these uh, funding, improving the financing terms and project cost, and maximizing IBRD. And here I would say the multilateral, because every multilateral will have a line available for a country. Like, uh, we don't have unlimited amount of money at the multilateral level. How to maximize it, basically, to get the maximum funding possible from the multilateral and the private sector. And then the, this flexibility of risk management and the funding that you have at some multilateral would allow you actually to reduce your overall debt management, debt risk, and, and allow you to implement your, your debt management strategy. And it will allow, basically, and this we have seen it over the last few years, for some countries to access private funding in very difficult conditions and uh, and this I, I'm mentioning here some of the guarantees that you have done lately in in Eastern Europe that allowed certain government basically to fund themselves in the market where the market almost was closed for for all their neighbors so I'm gonna stop here and just give you some little bit food for thoughts about how you think about the private sector and the combination of how I can attract actually more private funding into my general uh, balance sheet of a government, but also for for specific project that you need to finance. Thank you. Thanks, Isam. Um, just before we move on, I have a question to our sponsor, um, uh, Cheatham. To help structure the remaining time um, as best we can, what time should I aim to finish this? Okay. That's helpful. Now, I mean, I've, I've jotted down a number of questions, but before I, I go into some questions that I have, um, are there any questions that any of you would like to raise um, uh, for those on the panel? And in doing so also to share any experiences that you may have um, within your own countries on, within the same area. No? Okay, well, I'll start and um, I'll try to come back, but um, so one thing I was wondering and um, is really in terms of, of where a lot of the financing is coming from. So Olga had mentioned that um, um, between the EIB and the Council of Europe, um, they were able to help you meet a, a large amount of your financing needs. Um, but more broadly, between the, the multilaterals, the, the bilaterals, private sector financing, if you could each emphasize on more holistically the, the types of sources that you rely upon. And then I'm also curious to what degree has this changed over the last few years um, as we've entered the, the financial crisis? And to what degree are these resources between the multilaterals, bilaterals, and, and private sector financing allowing you to meet your needs in terms of volume, tenor, and cost? Um, but Olga, if you could start, please. Yes, actually, if we are analyzing the debt portfolio, an external one, 
During the last three years, the multilateral um, funds are increasing and bilateral or, de or decreasing. Even during one year, the bilateral is still decreasing and multilateral is increasing because the funds are coming from multilateral creditors. And therefore, the main partners of our country are still the multilateral creditors, which are financing the project mainly in infrastructure, so needed for our country. So now, um, before I move to Han, is, uh, I'm wondering, is, is a reason for that? Because a lot of the bilaterals were being funded um, through Europe who may have uh, less monies available for this? It's like we have a country strategy with different multilaterals, and they are like multilaterals are more active than bilaterals. But also during like, like last, in 2010, government of Poland was helping us as a bilateral. The government of Austria this year as a bilateral. But uh, anyhow, the share is still increasing with multilateral. Okay. And uh, Hien. Uh, in my country, thanks to multilateral uh, and uh, bilateral donors, that during uh, crisis, they uh, still commit to provide us a uh, um, high amount of money uh, from uh, ODA. So um, we still uh, get the advantage of low interest and uh, long durations from ODAs. Our strategy is that uh, we um, also uh, we, uh, have uh, external sources with uh, the low interest rates and uh, long maturity, but we explore with the um, trend rates. In our debt strategy, we want to uh, ship more our debt on domestic uh, currencies and we want to change our more debt on uh, domestic but uh, unlucky that uh, during crisis we uh, got difficulty in uh, raising funds by uh, domestic bo government bonds because uh, we have uh, short term um, government bonds only uh, two or three Yes, in maturity. So we face with uh, liquidity uh, problem. So um, we hope that in the next future we can uh, improve our domestic markets so we can uh, raise money in domestic with longer maturities. Okay, thanks. Um, so before I move on, any questions? Please. And if you could please introduce yourself as well. Sorry. I'm Sharon Almanza from the Philippines. Um, well, usually for, for um, project related financing, um, especially in our case, it's, it's mo most of the time, it's actually supply driven in the sense that ODA partners usually come into, for instance, department or to an agency saying that, well, we have this project that we think fits your uh, medium term development plan. And so, um, and we have a financing as well. So what happens, what happens is uh, we have an investment coordination committee that approves a certain project. And usually it's tied. So, um, well, in multilateral cases, it's also the same. So. Uh, a lender would, would say that, you know, um, we think that this project fits your um, development plan, so, you know, we can come in and finance this project. But so it's like the, the sovereign is not really um, in the position to, to choose which financing option, since usually a project is tied with the financing. But um, we are trying to establish, we are trying to, to veer away with that, um, um, what do you call this, um, operation. And I, I wonder what's the, the take of uh, multilateral institutions such as World Bank. Because um, I think our principal is reviewing a possibility of, well, we have, of course, we have projects. And we are, we're thinking that 
it, it's the option of the sovereign to either finance it through bilateral or through multilateral, but at the end, it should be an option of the sovereign. And I wonder what's a take on that of the donor partners. Thank you. Would you like to comment on that, Isam? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll comment from the World Bank perspective because I don't, I don't know of ev all the bilaterals and uh, multilaterals uh, usually how you are dealing with them. But from the World Bank perspective, I mean, when, when the World Bank deals with, with a government in any country, basically we deal with them based on a country partnership strategy that is drawn for three to four years of where the strategic involvement in the country is going to be. And that's basically drafted and, uh, and agreed with, with the government of these are like the strategic area where we want you to come as a multilateral and work with us on them. And the, f the funding part will be part of this strategy that has been discussed uh, very closely with the government. So, so we come usually under this unless we have certain emergency during the three, four years of the country partnership strategy, for example, like what has happened in Eastern Europe. So we, didn't move, we don't usually move away from the strategic view or uh, the, s the strategy of the government and what they have agreed with us. Now I know that, that in other cases, it's, and, and other, especially bilateral, it's not the case. They have like very specific sector that they would like to allocate money, but I cannot speak for that. But, but within even, like when you have a strategy with the bank, with the World Bank, and we will be coming at in a certain sector. Within that financing structure that we can give you, you have choices between like uh, loans or or uh, or guarantees, and you have also a team usually uh, in in the bank that would work with you on structuring different ways and bringing in commercial funding, and probably some other multilateral and bilateral to fund the whole to help you fund the whole project. Now, I know also that it's not being done in all countries, but some countries are taking a lot of advantage of the ability of the World Bank basically to, and its, it's, uh, its relation with a lot of private funders, but also in its ability to help structure the funding for a project in a way that will maximize the private sector involvement from a funding perspective and also reducing the risk and reducing the cost of these type of funding. So I hope I answered your question from our perspective, but I cannot unfortunately speak for all bilateral on this. We know that there are a lot of tied money out there. If I could, um, I mean, just add a comment on that from uh, the IFC uh, side or specifically the private sector side. As we move from the pure public sector side into the um, the areas of municipal finance um, into PPPs and, and the pure um, private projects, what we typically will find is the, the largest value added is, is our ability to take long tenors. Um, even in the current environment, a lot of times we're able to complement what we can provide on the very long-term financing with what others, whether it be a bank or other sources of institutional uh, money, money can bring. Just as uh, thinking of a real example there is a, is a product, um, and actually uh, um, Jay at City was going to describe this, but um, in his absences um, that we're working on with banks, but including City, is the ability to provide um, the equivalent of takeout financing just for the long end. So if we have, uh, say, commercial banks who might be willing to come in and provide five or, or ten year financing, um, whereas the project really needs 15 years, assuming that it's a good project in terms of being able to meet its financial and, and other covenants, IFC would be able to ensure that the project is able to refinance itself after five or ten years to secure the remaining financing needed um, for the duration of the project. Now, with that said, I think we've, we've reached our time. I don't know if there's, uh, I don't want to go over, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, other, other questions that any of you have? Yes, please. Hi, my name is Shai from uh, the Ministry of Finance, Israel. <clears throat> I don't know how to refer my question exactly, uh, but it's regarding risk management, and Olga has shown uh, 
a contribution pie, like with the different uh, uh, type of uh, uh, between fixed income and floating rate, and between maybe domestic and external debt. And my question is if there is any model, like risk model management, that you're working according to. Maybe the, the World Bank also can refer to that. Um, like regarding what is, how, how do you decide about your recommend uh, ATM, like of the debt portfolio? What is the, the ATM that should be, or the distribution between a local debt to external debt, uh, between the fixed income rate to the floating rate? Have you been examined the possibility to, to issue a CPI linked bond, bond because of the situation right now and banks that all over uh, printing, I don't know if printing money, but uh, doing any uh, quantitative easing, so maybe the inflation will rise, so is, if you can refer to that. Thanks. So just um, if I could recap the question, it's um, to expand upon the decision making in terms of understanding the makeup of the uh, debt profile that would be used for financing the projects in the public sector. Okay, I mean, I would have some comments, but if I could ask uh, if any of you could share um, first. Yes, actually, we are not using some risk models when we are choosing the interest uh, the interest rates during the disbursement, but we are using the toolkit of the World Bank MTDS when we are issuing the uh, issuing the strategy, and therefore we are settling also the the optimum uh, thresholds for the interest rates for ATM for ATR refixing risk as well. But uh, it depends on the country. For each country, it is different. This ATM and the the debt which. Uh, which matures within one year. If you are looking at Moldovan side, it is settled, but it is up to 35% will, will uh, be due in one year. Perhaps for some countries it's very high, but for us, because we have a very, uh, pro prob we are facing problem with liquidity on our domestic market and all the bonds are on the short maturity and we, sh we should issue bonds, but of course on the, uh, on the medium term we are proposing to develop our market, but uh, on the short run, so this is very specific for each country. Uh, in my countries, uh, most of our debts are concessional, but the we have faced with the uh, exchange rate risk, especially in uh, Japanese, with Japanese yen, because our um, around 40, uh, nearly 40 percent of our external debts are in Japanese. So, uh, to face with uh, exchange rate risk, we try to negotiate with the Japanese government to uh, convert the debt in uh, Japanese to uh, USD or maybe uh, Euros uh, currencies so we can reduce our risk on exchange risk. Uh, we also use MTDS uh, tools to, um, um, to, to see how uh, to, to set our um, the targets on debt management. But we think that's a big problem for our country, only exchange rates breaks. And uh, now we try to uh, change some um, Japanese loan to uh, USD. Thanks. Thanks. I mean, if, if I could just add, so I guess before I start, you'd have to see where I'm coming from in that my day-to-day my -day job is helping I me mean, to manage the institution's balance sheet. Um, which is AAA. So very conservative by nature. Now, with that said, when we would typically enter into conversations with our clients, our starting point is let's look at a scenario where potentially you're able to either, either fully match or as close as you can your assets and liabilities. And often that would come at a cost and often that would be seen as a prohibitive cost. But it's a good starting point. Um, and that in terms of matching the assets and liabilities, we're looking at it in, right in terms of tenor, in terms of currency, um, uh, in terms of cash flows. Now, the, the big first decision I, I, I find is really 
to what degree would we want to complement that with local currency financing? And one of our biggest uh, priorities at the moment as an, as an organization is really expanding the markets in which we can help clients access local currency financing. And to a large degree, this is true on the, on the IBRD side of the balance sheet as well. And what we'll be able to look at is so typically that's going to be for shorter tenors. And when you look at the dollar and euro interest rate environment, it's going to be for somewhat significantly higher cost as well. And it's sort of neither a, um, it's not a black and white situation. So it's saying that, well, okay, so if I were to start off and, and try ideally to finance this entirely with long-term shekels, well, that's going to come at a cost that might be prohibitive. It doesn't mean that I might not want to do part of it. I might want to go into some short-term shekel financing and end up complementing that and um, saying that might be where we're able to bring in banks or other providers for the rest of it, which may be in longer term, because we have longer tenors, uh, typically when we get into a dollar or a euro financing. I don't know if there's something that you want to add on that, no? Yes, please. does not generate an identifiable stream of revenue. Because at that point, I don't understand matching, matching the liability of five years to build a road that you don't have any identification that it will generate a particular stream of revenue to the government makes a very hard uh, decision rationally. Um, am I wrong in seeing this as perhaps a misapplication of asset liability structures? I can, um, I mean, Defer to Esam. So keep in mind that when I look at it in terms of the clients we work with, in IFC we only work with the private sector. So we would generally have a form of revenue collection which would be used to make the financing decisions. I've heard government say, well, nope. we decide to go for concessional borrowing rather than borrowing domestically because we couldn't expect very little. Sure. I don't know the specific government you're talking about, but there are uh, definitely different rationale in different governments. The, the idea basically of having no generation of income from a specific project doesn't mean that the project doesn't have to go through. Now, the decision of going, in this case, internationally to fund versus locally is also in a, a, a decision on the availability of local savings. So it's not only basically based on if all, if the country generate enough saving internally, they don't have to go most of the time outside. I mean, look at the U.S., for example. I mean, the outsider comes here to buy the, the treasury bonds, but they all always uh, borrow in dollar. A lot of countries do that uh, around the world. Uh, they borrow in their own currency because that's the least risky for them. Most of their revenue, it's tax, tax revenue. That's the general revenue that you're talking about. So it's not specific generated by. It's not the case in emerging world. So they might have thought about different rationale, but the, the basic thing underlying basically going outside is that you d there isn't enough saving internally to manage all the investment that is needed for the growth of the country. And, and this is, and for, in my opinion, this is like the main thing. It creates a currency risk, and that's then managed manage differently, was correlated with a different revenue that the specific government might have. When you go at the local level, it's a totally different scenario. So at the central level, you might have some revenue correlated with foreign currency. At the local level, those revenues start to diminish, and then the local the local currency becomes much more important uh, in in the funding uh, and the riskiness of now at the general level of that debt for that specific government. 
I'm gonna stop here because I mean there are a lot of intricacy in, in that specific decision but yes a lot of governments still need to go cross-border for funding a lot and these are like some of them are big countries they are not small and by nature okay so yeah so thank you very much um, uh, thanks for your understanding as well for uh, the agenda changes and and for for sticking it out with us bye-bye